but it's good. <laughs> it, it's uh, good to have an opportunity to talk about work that's been really important to me and um, discoveries that I made that have been really, really important to me and I think um, should be important to the church. So um, about uh, 14 years ago, I was teaching at Duke Divinity School, teaching pastoral faith. And um, I realized that I wanted to be engaged in the practice of pastoral care and not just teaching it. Um, so I sort of looked around to visit different places to do that, congregations, uh, hospital chaplain, uh, nothing was really panning out. And then I went to Urban Ministries, which you all are familiar with, and said, you know, I'd, I'd like to be your chaplain and you don't have to pay me. And so uh, at that point, Lloyd Schmiedler, Schmeidler said, sure, come on, come on. And so um, I like to think of that, as I said in the book, as a person who was in some ways professionally homeless, uh, was taken in at Urban Ministries, mm -hmm. uh, the way it's taken in many different people. Um, so you all, I'm sure, familiar with Urban Ministries. Yes, mm -hmm. You've probably all been there and maybe worked there and um, you know what it's like. And there's the men's dorm and the women's dorm and the cafeteria and food pantry and clothing closet. Um, and of course, there are social workers and mental health care providers and people who help the, the residents find um, housing. There's a medical clinic, uh, referrals to recovery programs. And so there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of services at Urban Ministries. Um, and one of the, the things that became acutely clear to me is that simply surviving homelessness is very difficult. Um, the elements, it's cold outside. When you all were um, talking about where you're gonna go for Thanksgiving, I started thinking about, uh, I, I started thinking about, okay, these people don't have a place to go for Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would piggyback on your question and say, where do you go when you want to get something to eat? Yeah. Go home. Where do you go when you want to get mail? You go home. Where do you keep your uh, keepsakes and things that are precious to you? You know, uh, things, objects that are bearers of your history. Uh, where do you go when you're sick? Where do you go after surgery? Um, these are all places that unhoused people don't have um, to go. And, and in particular, the not having any place to go when you're in poor health is really, really, really difficult. So being outside in the elements, um, being uh, blamed for being homeless, the shame of not having a place to live, uh, the violence um, to, against men and women, Part of the vulnerability of homelessness, um, and then just the <clears throat> profound loneliness uh, of, of homelessness. And uh, so it just became clear that just to survive when you don't have a place to live is very difficult. But it also became clear that leaving homelessness is also very, very hard. I mean, you know, appointments, uh, getting rejections from people who might have a place to live, unanswered phone calls. I swear those people's social workers are never ever at their office. And it's because they're, they're overworked, right? They're vastly overworked. So unanswered phone calls, waiting, 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 disappointment after disappointment. And um, so in my opinion, and what I think is true from my experience there, is that surviving and leaving homelessness requires spiritual support, that a spiritual disposition is absolutely essential if you're going to survive. And so what, what are um, elements of spirituality that I'm talking about? Hope. <laughs> People need to feel like 
something's going to happen. It's worthwhile looking for a place to live. Um, you see a quote there from one guy who dropped out of a group that I was leading. Um, I failed too many times. I can't bear to fail again. Okay. So these are people who, uh, many of them have tried many, many times to leave homelessness. Dignity. Uh, what in our, I'm sorry. What in our, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, what a tech genius. Um, yeah, dignity, the sense that you're beloved, beloved. This is also a matter of uh, a religious life, a sense of purpose, a sense of vocation, that you live not only for yourself, but you live for this purpose, whatever that is. Um, courage. A religious life gives you courage to face failure again and again, or if you're not trying to leave homelessness, simply to curl up in a corner in a parking garage again and uh, sleep the night. So um, again, surviving and, leave, and leaving homelessness are, are spiritual, are, require spiritual support, I think. So the categories of unhoused people that I saw at urban ministries, um, I saw some that came in from the encampments. You're familiar with the encampments. Um, I saw some that were when sort of pretty much the only time they'll be homeless in their life. You know, they have medical bills. They, uh, they're a woman trying to leave a difficult marriage. Um, and so they're in the shelter for a while and they leave. Um, but the people that I saw the most were the ones who are kind of in and out of homelessness. So they don't really fall in the category of the chronically homeless. Um, but there are people who have spent decades um, sleeping on their cousin's couch, being in the homeless shelter, a month at Butner, a little bit at the prison, uh, back into not having a place to live. And so this nomadic life in and out of shelter. And they were the ones, for some reason, that, um, that I got to know the best. So um, having realized that uh, spirituality, in fact, was a very important uh, part of being present with homeless people, um, I started a prayer service. Now, I just wonder how many of you are like I was 14 <laughs> years ago, and that is no. This is not about prayer. This is not about teaching Bible stories. This is about giving people a place to live, you need to work on their concrete needs, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Um, does that sound familiar? <laughs> like a familiar quality? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I, as I said, I think in order to even begin to confront your, the barriers to finding a home, you need spiritual support. So, the prayer service, uh, we met uh, three mornings a week. Uh, there's only one, uh, let's see, excuse me, one uh, instruction. It was completely unstructured. Uh, it was light a candle and say a prayer. And in fact, it was, uh, it, the, the room was set up like this room uh, with a, sort of a little podium thing up here in the front and a basket of sand and a basket of candles. Mm -hmm. And uh, the invitation was to come up and light a candle and then you stick it in the basket of sand. That's it. No prayer books, no order of worship, no hymnals, nothing. Completely unstructured. Um, it also was completely non-sectarian. Uh, you can see this... Um, Everyone is welcome at this service, whether you're a Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, Catholic, Jewish, Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or from another tradition, or from no tradition at all, or have not decided yet, you are invited. So it was clear that this was, uh, this was a place where everybody was welcome. Um, so my original plan was to have 
a darkened room, soft music playing, maybe like today or something, wordless. I, I put on some sort of Wyndham Hill. Anybody remember Wyndham Hill? Yeah. High music. Yeah. Uh, and people, um, I thought was, you know, the, the sort of wordless meditation. And then maybe come, somebody come up and light a candle and say, you know, for my son. And then sit down. The music <laughs> played on. Well, instead of my model of approaching the mystery of the divine, <laughs> people brought in their own religious form, right? Of course they would. Um, they didn't pay any attention to the model that I had in mind. <laughs> so they brought in forms of expression and belief, mostly, of course, from the Black church. About 90% of the people who came to my service um, were African American, and um, about eighty percent who go to urban ministries are African American. But the people who came to my service, they're mostly uh, there's a little bit higher percentage of um, of African Americans. And instead of sort of wordlessly approaching the mystery of the divine, <laughs> the approach was a proclamation of the certainty of God at work in your life. And absolutely uh, loud proclamation of the truth of God at work in your life. So I had to change course um, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, I had approached what I was I love that part of your book. <laughs> yeah, uh, I explained things to them. Um, I explained, you know, God is in this place, and God is also beyond, and God is mysterious, and we don't really know what God's doing, we have to come before God, you know. Well, <laughs> they would say, God will make a way out of nowhere, right? Uh, don't let the devil steal your joy. Uh, God will provide. Um, and I, I also have to, I had to shift from mostly empathetic statements to to proclamation so we're taught right in seminary in pastoral care you lead with empathy you lead with presence you don't try to tell people it's going to be all right because god's going to make it all right um and we're taught you don't really know what's going to happen so how can you speak for god and say what god's going to do well that was not the not uh, what they responded to um yeah, so I'll tell one story. It's in the book, too, about um, Henry. I, I came into the cafeteria, and um, <coughs> Henry was seated at one of the tables, and he was he was upset, I could tell. And I stopped and talked to him, and I said, oh, my gosh, Henry, what's wrong? He, he had been in and out of the prayer service, and he had a pretty significant speech impediment, and he held up this worship bulletin. He said, nephew nephew uh, he told me that his nephew had died in a house fire mm -hmm. and uh he you know it's just terrible so i invited him into the prayer service and uh eventually he stood up in front of the prayer service and you know told us how hard this was and he was teary-eyed and it was, he was just um heartbroken and then he sat down and I didn't want the prayer service to move on to somebody else. I wanted us to sit with him for a while. So I got up and I said, um, Henry, we, we are all heartbroken here with you. I'm so sorry. I believe God is with you in this time of sorrow. And uh, we are here and God is here. And colleagues that would be appropriate wouldn't it that's what we're taught so uh the whole room was silent and then somebody else got up and said henry your nephew is not dead he is just asleep and the room came alive henry <laughs> broke out into a smile and um this obviously touched something very deep uh in the group and in him, and uh, it gave him a lot of uh, you know, life and vitality, and I think hope. Um, so empathy was not enough. Um, 
Also, <laughs> lament. You know, we're we're trying to reclaim the category of lament in the um, in certainly in mainline seminaries. That that's an appropriate way to speak to God when you feel like God is absent, when it seems like the suffering is endless, and you can see no sign of God's presence anywhere in this place. And so we as pastors, pastoral caregivers, point people to lament. You know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, my bones are showing. I uh, what are some other laments? Um, I can't sleep. Uh, wax. What? My wax poured out. But I, yeah, I'm like wax for you. Yeah, right. Mm. So this is a way we say stay connected to God and the truth of our suffering, right? Lament did not go over well <laughs> at all. Not at all. Their impulse was ex to give expressions of gratitude. Mm -hmm. um, gratitude for what remains, mm -hmm. for what's still here. And um, uh, I thought that was very, mm -hmm. very, very significant. Mm -hmm. um, so I became interested in the, their forms of expression and then the content of their beliefs, especially as they spoke to each other to give each other encouragement. What did they call upon in their faith to encourage each other? Um, well, as I said, lots of Proverbs. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Proverb, whip out a proverb. Everybody, yes, 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 mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I did a little research on Proverbs. And um, Proverbs are so much more than a delivery of content. They um, evoke memories of the places where people first heard the, you know, from your grandmother in your grandmother's kitchen or on your way to school or the loved one, um, who you heard saying it all the time. My grandmother used to say, um, and it, they also create community because when I say, don't let the devil steal your joy, well, you all know that saying too, and we're connected and, and we uh, form sort of community is um, formed. Um, they're also very flexible. Uh, they can be applied to a variety of situations, and um, they function as a way of interpreting what's going on, of interpreting pain or interpreting joy or interpreting hopelessness. Um, so they're they're uh, they're not so much inner truth as they are wielded for a purpose. Okay. <clears throat> So let me, uh, another, uh, first of all, are there any questions? I feel like I'm yammering along out here. Um, all good? I was yeah. just thinking about the Proverbs this way. Like, you know, if somebody says a proverb and you know it, it's kind of like reminding each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you said something about community with it. Yeah, it does. It, it's very. It's like a mutual reminding. Yeah, yeah. Another form, excuse me, another form I heard a lot was testimony. Uh, people would stand up and say, uh, well, let's see, one of, one of them I wrote about in the book was, you know what, I pulled up to the gas station and there was a $20 bill right there on the ground and I picked it up and God's looking out for me. And um, so a testimony uh is more than just a story. It's a story told as an account of what God is doing, okay? And furthermore, it's told for the upbuilding of the whole community, all right? So if God is spending $20 bills and keeping the bus from leaving so I can get on it. Mm -hmm. God is doing that for me and God is gonna surely do that for you. So it's much more than just a story. And implicit in a testimony, I believe, is deep affirmation of a person's humanity. God chose me. God chose me to bless. 
God has not abandoned me. I am worthy. I am worthy of God's blessings. So imagine if you hadn't had a shower in a month, you just, you were high all night last night. Your family's abandoned you. They're sick of you. Imagine being able to say, God blessed me. God blessed me in this way. So let me tell you a little bit about Joyce. Um, this is Joyce's actual picture. It was on uh, Facebook, Urban Ministries Facebook. So I felt like it was uh, <clears throat> all right to share it here. And plus I kind of occluded her face a little bit, but um, can you read that, Marita? What the, this is what the world said. Oh, sorry, <laughs> this is what the world says. <laughs> about Joyce. Oh my gosh, you can't really see it very well. Okay. Joyce is a chronically homeless Black woman, a prostitute and drug addict who repeatedly cheats social services. She will not get a job. She does not care about her family, education, morality, health, or being a productive member of society. That's what Common the world we might say about, um, about a woman who's homeless, who um, has certain Flaws. Okay. Um, actually, Sherry, would you mind? Would you mind reading that? Sure. So Joyce's testimony. I got baptized when I was twelve. I got pregnant when I was nineteen, and went into my church to have my baby baptized. They wouldn't do it because she was out of wedlock. So I turned right around, never went back to church. Never. I'm not going to your church if you can't christen my baby. I had started getting into drugs. God allowed me to see that if I stayed in New York, I'll, I'm, I'm going to kill myself with drugs. So she moved to North Carolina. Oh. I met my husband in the streets. It was during the time when I was selling my body, getting high. I actually fell in love with him in the streets. We dated for 18 years and we've been married for seven I'd done some of everything. I'd done retail, I'd done cashier, I've done stock. I took care of Alzheimer's patients and I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I took care of them like they belonged to me. I was chronically homeless for years, always at an overnight at an overnight. I came back one day too late. They threw everything away, even with all the important documents and the pictures that they threw away, you know, what you know what hurt me the worst? My Jesus calling and Bible promises for women. That hurts so bad. I read daily bread, inspirational books, the Bible itself, and then something certain, Sorry. Um, certain things come up. Come on, baby, pray. Oh, and when certain things come up, come on, baby, pray. I love documentaries. I'm a geek. I really am. I'm really a geek. I'll turn my grandson into a geek. He's a World War II buff like me. <laughs> I just rely on God. Every morning before I leave out that dorm, I read the whole armor of God every morning. And I still get frustrated. I still get upset. But then I say, okay, who am I? I'm a trooper. And I know God's got me. I look so dim, but I've been told by many ministers that when it looks that way, he's right there at your back. I have to count on that because looking at things, it's so bleak. I would give up. That's why I say it. I know God's got me. So how does her testimony of what God's doing in her life differ from the um, dominant vision of, of Joyce? What's, what stands out to you? Well, the, the dominant vision is what well people see and make evaluations of, kind of looking at the outside. Mm -hmm. You know, she's getting money for sex. She doesn't have a job right now. Those kinds of things. But her testimony is a lot more about the inside mm -hmm. and what she's feeling yeah. and, and the support she, she believes she's getting. Yeah. What things about her life does she disclose that are sort of counter to the stereotype of a homeless woman? Documentaries. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's got a life of the mind. Yeah. You know, a steady happens. relationship. Yeah. A steady relationship. Yep. Yeah. Right, exactly. Some daily habits. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Most of your habits. Better mm -hmm. than most of ours. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the caring for others with the Alzheimer's. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that she loved it. Yeah. yeah. She really, it was yeah. life giving for her. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The way she's contributed. Yeah. Which is, yeah, exactly. She's, she's contributed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I think is significant about her testimony is she's not using it to hide any of the things that might be considered shameful, mm -hmm. right? I was selling my body. I was a drug addict. Um, I met my husband commercially, if you want to say that. <laughs> um, he was her customer. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but she doesn't use this testimony about what God's doing in her life to hide from the truth. So it's a way of her speaking the truth of her life in a way that confers dignity and um, uh, a confidence that God is with her. So what I said in the book is that, um, well, let me back up. Um, lots of secular activists think that religion is the last thing that homeless people need, right? Um, that it's private, it's individualistic, it doesn't do anything to challenge the systems of power that are oppressing people. So what I wanted to claim is these testimonies, these are stories of resisting oppression. These are stories, these are counter narratives as they talk about in critical race theory. These are subversive stories uh, that give an alternative reading of a person's life. And um, so, um, so I, I, these are some of the, I, I distilled what I thought were their primary beliefs into these four categories. Um, the deep existential confidence that God will provide. Um, and they're not, I mean, some of them are sort of naive, but they're not, a lot of them aren't naive. They don't think God's going to plunk down an apartment for them. Uh, they, they know it's going to be a struggle. They know it might not happen soon, um, but they do believe that God will provide. And I'm, of course, I'm talking about uh, in a corporate sense, not every single individual. Again, I thank God. Practices of gratitude are very central. Um, the idea that the devil is real, that sort of threw me for a while uh, about the devil. Presbyterians don't talk that much about the devil. I mean, do you all have any reactions if somebody would say, well, you know, that's the devil that's inside that person. That's why she did that. Or... Yeah, I relapsed again last night. You know, the devil, devil, devil is strong. Um, I think in the in the circles, I, I would call it the enemy. The enemy. The enemy. Mm -hmm. The enemy is there. There's an enemy in all of us. I think. Yeah. 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 And if you want to call it the devil, yeah, yeah, yeah. bad stuff happens. Right. Bad stuff that, happens. That's what I think of when you know some of the songs. It's like mm -hmm. you think of because there's real bad stuff that happens. It's mm -hmm. hard to yeah. understand. Yeah, I think this belief that the devil is real helps explain why bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you pull the bad stuff into a Christian narrative and say it's the devil, you're also saying. And God has defeated the devil. We know that, right? So um, there were a couple of times when I did not think devil language was appropriate and when they would use it to go after another individual. Right? Yeah. He's got the devil inside him. Um, some people, although I don't, I didn't really see this very much, but use it as an excuse for relapsing or, mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, but I really decided that people who bear the brunt 
of the world's evil, much more than I do, have a much deeper knowledge of evil than I do. And they can call it whatever they want to. Is it, is it really thin? I mean, thin is real? Yeah. I mean, could you say that even? Sin is real. I mean, it's a, but I feel they also more. So they say when they talk about, um, say, violence in Durham is up. Let's say that's the devil. The devil is loose in Durham, mm -hmm. right? And you could say violence. If you do an analysis of why places get violent, it really is more than just individual flaws, right? Mm -hmm. You're talking about structural, structural, well, structural sin, sin. Yeah. structural yeah. sin, right? Mm -hmm. Corporate sin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, uh, there are things that surprised me. There was very little theodicy, you know, like if I'm in such bad shape, can there really be a God? You know, <laughs> um, I, I doubt God because my life is so miserable. I might've heard it once in 14 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, there's no intellectual debate about science versus religion. Um, there's no questioning of the authority of the Bible, right? And if the Bible is your lifeline, you're not going to question it, right? Um, this is the words of one uh, liberation theologian who I really like, Miguel de la Torre. When people live under oppressive structures, they turn to the Bible for the strength to survive another day. The Bible is not read with the intellectual curiosity of solving cosmic mysteries. Rather, they look to the text to find guidance in dealing with daily life, a life usually marked by struggles and hardship. Huh. So I'm... I'm getting toward the end here, and this is kind of the main point that I want to make. And I, I want this book to be a call for privileged people to get proximate, to get close to the lives and struggles of people on the margins. Um, have you all read um, just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Mm -hmm. This is one of his things, right? Mm -hmm. We have to get proximate. Um, and uh, Tattoos on the Heart, Gregory Boyle. He talks about kinship, uh, not service from afar. So why do we need to get uh, proximate? Because it is about kinship, because we are connected to people in East Durham. They are our family. We need to respond to them, as though they are our relatives. Uh, we shouldn't block out their suffering. We shouldn't um, uh, ignore it because, which, you know, so easy to do. I, I certainly do it, but we should respond to them as though they are kin. Um, the second reason I think we need to get proximate is I do believe in a mysterious way that God is on the margins like nowhere else. Now, you have to be careful when you say that because we believe God is everywhere, of course, right? But even as there's a thin a thin place, what is it in Iona? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A thin place. A thin place. Mm -hmm. I think dwelling among the poor is also a thin place mm -hmm. where you, in time, you do sense the presence of God in this place in a more vivid way. Have any of you ever um, been on the church trip to a poor country, say in Central America, um, and you think, whoa, these people have such deep faith, so much deeper than mine. The joy here is phenomenal in the presence of such deep suffering, right? Um, that's sort of what I'm talking about. Um, which is really kind of the third point there is we have so much to learn about faith mm -hmm. because people who have nothing to depend on but God, nothing. I mean, their ID was stolen last night. They have no cash. Mm -hmm. They can't get into the homeless shelter, right? What are their alternatives for what they're going to depend, depend on? Well, they develop habits of depending on God. Not everybody, <laughs> 
but a lot of people. And um, I think we can learn about radical dependence on God from people who have nothing, okay? Um, yeah, I have a, a quote from Father Boyle that says, um, the measure of our kindness lies not in our service to those on the margins, but in our kinship with them. The measure of our kindness lies not in our service to those on the margins, but in our kinship with them. This is a big challenge. This is, a, and I don't have an answer to how congregations respond to this challenge. But <coughs> I do believe that churches should take up the challenge to find out how as a congregation, we are gonna draw closer to the lives and struggles of people on the margins, at urban ministries, at Step Up, people who sleep in the bushes, right? Um, we, we have, we should challenge ourselves to figure out how to do that as a community. And so finally, I really like this quote from Pope Francis. Um, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty profound challenge, I think, to us. So thank you so much for listening to me and considering these ideas. Um, yeah. Susan, I just want to say, um, just today, actually, it's so interesting that this, that we're doing this today. Um, Housing for New Hope on January the 25th is having its um, its count, its yearly count. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, they yeah. do a head count of all the people who come up. And they're looking for people to do that count. Mm -hmm. and, and I told them that we would, um, our congregation count us in. So um, be looking for that. That's a way to get proxy. Right, absolutely. Um, yes. go, they, they assume that most people are in shelters who can be in a shelter. And so that's a good time for them to then go count who's not in shelters. And you take water and, and blankets and um, it's on an app on your phone. You go in pairs or triplets mm -hmm. and they'll train you and everything. Mm -hmm. But just be looking for that. Yeah. That's a good it's, call. it's a powerful, I've done it a couple of yeah. times on the home I've gone and it, it and, I, and I did three or four years in a row and kind of early on they were like, oh, you can walk, like get your boots on, put your coat on, like you're a relatively young person. We want you to drive and you're going to go with this. How we bring up staff person and a couple of people are going to go with you and you're going to find unsheltered. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, I and I took in the front seat. It was like, turn left, go, go back, turn that, go behind there. Yeah, and I was like, what are not? I mean, it's like, come on. And I was like, the coffee person. Um, and I was like, creep. <laughs> <know. laughs> but all all the places we see people I mean, until three in the morning, we were, wow. We, we were counting, and I was the person who would be like, he's trying to get them to fill out a form and do the counting stuff that, oh, that right at yeah. the point in time count is tied to massive amounts of HUD funding and so yeah. that we've got to get good data and I would just be like ah, I can't have that <laughs> and we, you know we had snacks and other things but it, it was it was it was powerful because it was a it was a profoundly human endeavor right yeah and it, 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 it really it is. was yeah. like, oh and now there are a good number of places in town that I drive by not terribly often you know if you don't live near some of those places but I drive by and I go oh you know what get that Behind those bushes, mm -hmm. from there mm -hmm. you'll never not there. There are eight, ten yeah. back there. Like you, you see, yeah, where these people are living in profoundly different ways. Yeah, um, and learning the gratitude and respect for these people who do, who are out on the streets trying to make mm. connections with those folks. And more often than not, they'd walk down on the bridge and they would call the name of a person yeah. who they do lived on that bridge. And that person would call the name of the staff person because they had a relationship, yeah. you know. And that's it was that was a terribly inspiring thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because of their proximity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my experience with the Catholics was with a job I had a few years ago mm. at the local Kroger store. We don't have those anymore, <laughs> but. Uh, close by, there were two encampments. Mm -hmm. One was right across, I'm talking about Patsy Place, that was here, and one was 
if you know where the big lots is now and the parking lot just on the other side of the street mm -hmm. but then there was another one back on private property and uh, you know Kroger, the story was that Kroger didn't want the uh, union in North Carolina um, long story short they bought out Harris Teeter which is based in Matthews and therefore is not unionized like Kroger itself is which is based in Cincinnati pulled out the Kroger brand and most places got converted to Harris Teeter, but of course, then those people had to figure out where else they could go to be close to some place where they could get their food. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I was thinking I might have seen a few tents around the Walmart just down the road. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, my vocabulary is different from yours, uh, and some experiences are, but one of the things that really comes out to me is complete lack of control mm. and so you mentioned that you know Joyce had her stuff tossed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know the whoever's in charge has to be very careful about a lot of things now I, since I'm talking and everybody's listening I'll just keep going <laughs> yeah. I'm a security officer Mm -hmm. And I related strongly to the little story about Joyce and the security office. Mm -hmm. And if you've not read it before, I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. Mm -hmm. Security officer showed up in the what, women's area mm -hmm. and announced man on the floor. Mm -hmm. That's a curse. That's what you would expect somebody to do. Mm -hmm. She got a little sassy with him. Well, are you a real man? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, he gives her a 24, meaning a 24 hour out the door and don't come back for 24 hours until you're back in. Then she has to figure out where to go. Now, as a hopefully professional security dude, I just found that to be just completely off the wall. And I think <laughs> if I was in that position, uh, I'd say something like, I. I might not say anything. I might just sort of grin sheepishly and go, oh, well, you know, and turn around and avoid the whole situation. But mm -hmm. that person chose that route. Mm -hmm. And I actually had a question about that, but you don't, you may not know the answer to mm -hmm. it, which was, is that, is the security office, and I'm not aware of that. I, I, I wasn't aware they had security staff there. But is that person hired through an uh, outside company, or is it high, that person hired directly by the uh, urban ministries? Um, well, I, um, I don't think they're urban ministry staff. Yes. I think that they contract out to a security yes. place. Yes, and I, that's the way I work. I work yeah. for a separate company. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, as as gross a situation as that was that it would be my preference that that person be hired directly and be considered on staff mm. and sit in on staff meetings mm. so that there would be a, um, a way to improve mm. rather than just say we can't have this guy working here anymore he's gone uh -huh. And one of the things about working through a contract security company is Urban Ministry Center pays considerably more to the company than that guy is making. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, and I've, I've seen it before that security officers may well be thinking, well, and I'm not sure about this, but I had a situation. Well, if they're not going to pay me very much, then I'm going to get, you know, get something personal out of this, which mm -hmm. is I'm going to regard myself as being bigger than a private citizen, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we are. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I've had some experience with actually the predecessor to Urban Ministry Center, and mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I don't think we have them, but uh, uh, it's, it's those little things where all of a sudden, she, you know, her dignity is stripped bare mm -hmm. by one comment yeah. from one individual. Yeah. And there, as far as I could figure out the scenario, you know, sort of thinking through it, 
um, there was no recourse. And if it was after hours, there was no member of the right. ministry staff around to say, hey, now let's just back off of this yeah. a little bit. Right? Yeah. 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 You know, that's a personal outlook on that, but uh um that's interesting yeah. to hear you talk about kind of the character of unpa underpaid people who maybe are bored <laughs> and they want to well, exert their power. Yeah. And then one thing is, I don't know what time of day or night that was, you know? Mm -hmm. And and uh, it would have wouldn't have been good if it had been during the daytime. It would have been terrible. It was after business hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good insight. Yeah. Susan, I had another, um, so um, I'm almost finished with the book, but um, one of the things I was struck by was you said that a lot of times like something good would happen, like somebody would buy gas for them or do oh, yeah. a bus card or something like that. And they would thank God and they would say, thank you, God, for putting it on that person's heart to give. They wouldn't thank the person. Mm -hmm. Right. They wouldn't say, oh, this really nice lady gave me a bus card. They would say God gave me a bus exactly. card. And mm -hmm. I have just been thinking about that ever since I read it and how humbling that mm -hmm. is. Like, and that that is the way you should approach it. And you as a person who's handing out bus cards should not be so proud of yourself uh, for handing out bus cards. It's God who put it on your heart yeah. to do that. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, so when I was reading that, I was really struck yeah. by that. It's not about the person who's there, you know, like when we volunteer or right. something like that. It's right. about God uh -huh. working through people mm -hmm. and the people who receive that help are thankful to god right like, it's not right. really you um and yes. that was one of the things i i mean is that interpreting correctly kind of what you were saying um well over interpreting you know, I, I love i love that interpretation um the way i thought about it was the guy who uh the security guard bought him boots bought yeah. him work oh, boots yeah. mm -hmm. um well, so when they told the story, and again, they said, oh, God is so good. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. And I was thinking, well, I think the security guard was extremely generous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to do that. And um, so I've actually talked to other uh, people from Black church traditions, and uh, they said that <clears throat> they are so, that Black people are so used to not having agency that they attribute agency to God and not mm -hmm. to other humans. Mm -hmm. So um, so white people were used to making a difference and giving away shoes and accomplishing things. And so we we say that we did it. Yeah. And at some level we did, right? right? We did obey God, if you want to say that. But um, they attribute all good things to God. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking the great thing about that is it keeps them indebted to God and not to somebody else. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, nice. You gave me something, but I'm I'm indebted to God. I'm not indebted that to was God. God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because otherwise you might stop touching the good thing. Oh, if it made you indebted to. Do you know what I mean? Well, that's what we do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know people who will not let you bring them a meal because. They really don't want to feel indebted to. Uh, that's really true. That's not true of me. Someone's got a question. Um, yeah. uh, so the question here is, how can we respond to people asking for mm. money while folks put them in and respond? That person needs to be seen, but a couple of dollars isn't going to help. Do we buy food or give a bottle of water rather than just saying no? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'll tell you what I do is I never, ever, ever give money, um, but I always speak to them. I always say, um, gosh, you know, I, I can't do that right now. And um, then if it's appropriate, if they're still there, I might start talking about the weather or how are you doing or you staying around here or. Uh, I try to engage them as a human being and not just be, well, first of all, don't ignore them. I think that's one of the worst mm -hmm. things. 
actually, I saw my brother do that the other day. Somebody was coming up and he just ignored him and walked on. I thought I, I had a little conversation with him about that. <laughs> but, um, but a lot of why I don't give money has to do with Terry Alba. Yeah, yeah. Terry says don't. Yeah. He says don't give, don't give stuff. There's a guy. <laughs> and you, he's, I'll tell you where he is now. He's at um, the corner of Markham and what would that be? Is it uh, Buchanan? No, it's um, Broad. Um, you know where that Strings store is? That yeah, and there's a dollar store across from. Kai Right. He's on that corner. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, so you've probably seen him, um, but I started getting to know him, you know, 20 years ago when I noticed him on a different corner. And the reason I noticed him was I thought, oh my gosh, he's, he's so handsome and well put together. What, yeah, what's going on? And I've watched him deteriorate mm -hmm. over time and he's had lip surgery and he's skinny, skinny, skinny. And. So I asked Terry Alaba about him and um, Terry said, and this is a while ago, it's not the situation with him now, but it was a while ago. He said, we have reached out to him so many times. We are trying so hard to, you know, share our services with him and he always refuses it. And he says he can make more money there in the corner than he can in other ways. Mm -hmm. And so what emerged in my mind was when you give money to people standing on the corner, it's sort of like you're paying them mm -hmm. to stay here on the corner and to not go get services. Yeah, it, it, it goes back to that kinship thing, too. Mm. I have a brother who was, a, who was mm. an alcoholic, and um, <laughs> there's just a point where you keep your purse locked up mm. for his sake, mm. not just for because he just couldn't be responsible mm -hmm. to it he almost had to be forced into a corner I don't know but mm -hmm. I never stopped ta never stopped talking to him never mm -hmm. stopped cheating mm -hmm. but at some point you don't keep putting the the thing that's hurting mm -hmm. at their disposal mm -hmm. I, I don't know any other way to say it I mean that sounds I mean, awful it's, maybe it's just hard and that's yeah it's it's hard. Be different. so I think I don't know who wrote that on that but it's just hard because like I work in downtown Durham right Every single day, Every single like day. I stopped going outside and walking around the block at lunch because you're literally asked at every single corner mm -hmm. for something. Mm -hmm. um, the problem is the first time you give somebody something, they find you the next time you go out of the door mm -hmm. and then you're then you are obligated. Now, I will also say, not a single person I've ever given money to or taken into Bodega and bought food for or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they always say, "God bless you." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every single one. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's never like thank you. It's a like, God bless you. Mm -hmm. um, so it is. I mean, it's really hard. Like I see her and I let this Chris knows it's like I'm the action person. I like sit and listen to all this, and I'm like, okay, that's great. And, we can keep bringing spirituality into it, but I keep trying to think like, what are those things? Like, what do I do every time I see that question? I just always want to do so much more than. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why I send I money to house for new up every yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> Would it be helpful to have, uh, this is something, because I don't remember locations very well, mm -hmm. but I, I always want to be able to say, have you been to urban ministry? Mm -hmm. And and just give them a card or something because mm -hmm. um just, I think a few people might not know where it is. This, so this, this can be, this is yeah. the advertisement for, I'm doing this for you, Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, yeah. They're, I think, I think they're helping hands that are yeah. actually yeah. right outside yeah. his door. Yeah. Um, that are, and right down there, that are not, yeah, that are, that are on attempt, right? Um, and then all of these are imperfect solutions, but mm -hmm. it has some information. Yeah, yeah check that out. information. Check the bags. But there's there's some food and some information. Um, but I think right. I mean, I think all these are imperfect solutions, but I think that's mm -hmm. yes. sure. as good as any of the really hard. What so it's hard. I mean, it is to get, get Sam a chance. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Sam. Uh, thanks. I really yesterday. My plan was to do that tonight. I woke up this morning and think I have this new flu. I'm really sorry. I'd love to do that. Um, 
Yeah, we do the homeless bags. I was interested, Susan, in what you had to say about money. I think that's quite true. What we do have in the bag, I don't know how much attention. We, we have a resource sheet. And I, I just have a specific question. One resource uh, item we have there is the 211 number that the United Way does. It just sounded, I'm a technology guy, and I thought, well, you know, here's a communication link. Do you know if homeless people, if they are aware of that number, do they? Do you think they might use it? And do you know how effective it might be? Um, I don't know. I really don't know. I think that's a really good question. I do know that most of them have phones, and a lot of them have right. smartphones. Right. Um, but that's that's a really good question. I, I haven't seen posters about it at Urban Ministries. I just haven't seen it. But I think that's a really, that's, that's a really yeah, it's, good. Yeah. It's available 24 seven and uh, yeah. sometimes there's a fairly long wait, but man, that really ought to be tried out to see if it is effective, and let people know about it. Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. And, and it's basically a clearinghouse of information to point people for uh, supportive services of uh, housing, medical care, financial support. Yeah, 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 yeah. So are you involved at Urban Ministries? Uh, just through the church. I shouldn't say just through the church. That uh -huh. of, yeah. We, we uh, serve. A slight uh, way to put it. Uh, but yeah, we serve, serve yeah. meals there. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, and I know, know Terry Alabama as well. But uh, yeah, I guess I was interested too in what we might say to people. We hand out this homeless bag. And, and I'm thinking about what a challenge it is to do what uh, Reverend Boyd said, you know, to go beyond service to kinship. I just, it's so superficial for us just to hand out this bag. And I, are there any other specific things you might suggest that we say to someone when we hand them the bag? Oh, just chatting. At least this is what I do. Like, oh, I've got a bag for you. Yeah. Um, it's getting chilly out there, isn't it? But I think you might enjoy this. And uh, you doing okay today? All right. Oh, and if I'm really chatting, I say, "Well, what's your name?" Yeah. And um, so, well, I hope I hope things go well for you, or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just um, just talk. Yeah. Okay. Also, uh, kinship is a goal, but uh, beyond service, but we could do a better job of service too mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and and maybe you know some debriefing of this meeting with maybe local missions is mm -hmm. what what else might the church do yeah. in turn and i know there's been a the committees what is it chris uh committed to abolish homelessness that meets in the church uh, i don't know what the mm -hmm. fellow community, whether it's in poverty or I mean, lots of kind of community collaborative groups. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I just um, wonder what kind of specific marching orders for us as a religious community at Westminster, what might be trying to do differently? Are you asking me for marching? Well, I'm, I'm that question <laughs> that, that yeah. question's out there yeah. floating around, but yeah, sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, um, for a congregation. Well, I don't want to pass the buck, but I do think you need to discern your call. I think I think you need to have a, a prayerful discernment process. Mm -hmm. And um, I will say that I focused on being present with people and offering spiritual care, and I didn't do anything else. I didn't, well, I didn't something, but um, um, I, I was able to do that because I knew at Urban Ministries there were social workers, mental health providers, people yeah. looking for homes, there was a medical clinic, mm -hmm. and I really felt like that freed me to focus on these other things. Um, so I don't want to say every congregation should go out and do what I did, but I do want to say that congregations should be in relationship with the people that they're serving in one way or another. Um, 
to have dinner together or pray together or uh, do a Bible study together. Um, that's, that's really what I want to challenge churches to do. Um, and, you know, it wouldn't work to have 12 people from Westminster show up at Urban Ministries and say, come on, I've got the Bible. Let's do a Bible study. You know, wow. just, I was going to ask, are you still doing your prayer service? I well, with COVID, everything stopped mm -hmm. and we met outside <laughs> during mm -hmm. COVID in the heat and the cold. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I have some folding chairs in the back of my car and we're still doing that, although they have now allowed us to go into the cafeteria. But as you all probably know, people are eating in the cafeteria. So that was really the way I connected with people and formed relationships was when they're eating together. So I, my, the group of people that I interact with is, you know, sort of separated from me now, but mm -hmm. yeah. But we are there Monday morning, nine o'clock, half an hour, mm -hmm. prayer service. <laughs> wow. You came and taught knitting. I did. And I, I came to your prayer service. Yeah, you did come to my prayer yeah. service? Okay, good. Mm -hmm. good. It was like what you said. <laughs> like what I said. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, I feel like this is a wonderful time to bring this to a close. So thank you so much, Susan, for yes. this okay. special evening. And let's thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are you willing to close with prayer? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. Let's pray. Oh God, help us to um, to discern, to understand, to have warmer hearts toward all your children, however they are, whether they are housed or not. And especially this night, we pray for those who are not. Um, draw close to them and um, make them thankful for whatever small they have bits they have, and make us thankful for their faith and make us respond. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. There are lots. I mean, oh we need people to sign up for Urban Ministry for December. I just want to say. Actually, we need people to sign up for Families Moving we need Forest for December, December, too. December. December. Serving dinner. The way, there, there are so many things that you can do. I will send you an email. Okay. Good. I, I,